Here's what's coming up on episode 37 of the Big Seance Podcast. Marion Hover. Once you've sort of left your development groups and then you go on to a close circle, if you're lucky enough to get that chance to work with a medium that's already established, you'll go to meetings with that medium and then the churches maybe phone you and say, well, actually, you were quite good tonight. And I say I was 13 years old when I first attended Spiritualist Church and I was told one of my very early meetings that I was going to be a platform medium and I thought, yeah, okay, (laughs) when's that ever going to happen? So I rushed down to him. When I got nearer to him, I thought, he's dead. I could see him standing by his body and he was just looking down at himself and he looked totally bemused, half as though somebody had just come out of... Uh, a car smash or something and was like what on earth has just gone on I could see in my mind's eye that he turned his back to me and just walked forward I just have this deep feeling inside that I was supposed to be there at that time I must admit my experience of Ouija up until then well I'd never done it but I'd heard some horror stories and we all looked at each other and I thought Oh, what on earth? What on earth's going on here? (laughs) And I'll tell you something, Patrick, it was one of the best evenings we ever had. We were talking about this for weeks. I think the energy in the group helps. And spirit like the light energy. They like the energy of laughter. And we found the more we sit around and joke and uh, everyone starts laughing, the quicker (laughs) the, the glass moves on the board. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the sands. Welcome back, Paranerds. I have a question. How many of you listen to Tune In Radio on the go? I am proud to announce that you can now find the Big Seance Podcast on Tune In, which is great news, especially for Android users, apparently. So if you know someone who listens to Tune In Radio and doesn't know about our little show here, send them a link. It'll be in the show notes every week now. Search for Big Seance Podcast on their phone and tell them they need to be listening. The world could use a few more pair nerds, right? I also wanted to say thank you to Diane and Denise of the History Goes Bump podcast. They had me on their show a few weeks ago to talk more about the Myrtle's Plantation. It was so fun, and I was honored to be invited. I'll throw that link in the show notes as well. Now let's get to this episode of the Big Seance Podcast. It is kind of part one of what I've been calling a two-part series on mediumship in the UK, specifically England. In this episode, I'll be talking to a medium named Marion Hover. Then the next time you hear from me, I'll be talking to Claire Broad. These are two mediums who reached out to me at about the same time. They have been friends of the show and have been very supportive. But until recently, I don't believe they've known about each other. There are some interesting similarities between the two, but also very different I'm telling you, there's fascinating stuff going on in the UK and the psychical and spiritual world, and I'm not sure those of us here in the US completely realize it. Of course, I'll be asking them about their experiences as mediums, but we'll also be talking quite a bit about spiritualism and what are known as development circles. Now, before I share my interview with Marion, I have to mention something that's coming up in our discussion. I asked Marion if she was familiar with the work of the Skoll Group in England. I've blogged about Skoll and done a lot of reading on those experiences. Very cool stuff. Skoll is spelled S-C-O-L-E. 
Apparently, I haven't been pronouncing it clearly. And until after the interview, Mary thought that I was saying a skull, as in S-K-U-L-L. What makes it even more important is that in the next episode, I had the same experiences with Claire. So when that moment comes, realize that they may or may not know about Skull, but they also think I'm speaking of something very different when you hear it in the interview. (laughs) So my apologies. It's the Hick, Missouri accent, I suppose. I'll know now that I have to be more clear. So I'll be back a little bit later to mention some listener feedback. I've had more reasons to do that lately, so that's very cool. All right, here we go. So very early on in the life of this podcast, I began hearing from a new wonderful listener from across the pond. I hear from several listeners from across the pond, actually. And one of those listeners was Marion Hover, who is a platform medium from Ashford, Kent in in England. We've been in touch quite a bit, and she has been very supportive and always contributing feedback. And I am intrigued by some of the things going on in Marion's life. And I've heard she's doing some interesting work with the Ouija board And so I decided I just needed to have her on to catch up and see what she's doing. Welcome, Marion. Hello. It's really nice to be on your show, Patrick. Well, thank you. It's nice to have you, too. You've been a good friend already in uh, talking about different spiritual topics and always giving me feedback and saying hello. So I appreciate that. That's no problem at all. You've you've helped me out no end, actually, sort of more than you know about. So, uh, yeah, it's really good. Well, good. That's kind of you to say. I want you to explain to us what a platform medium is. It's a term we don't hear too often here in the States. Okay, that's um, it, that sort of surprised me when you said that because um, I've been working as a platform medium for probably about seven or eight years now. And a platform medium is basically when you've, what we call, you've left the nest. You've, you've left that medium that you've been a fledgling of and you've basically flown the nest and then you become a platform medium. So that means that you go around perhaps churches, places that they hold, and even in the clairvoyance, and you literally you will take the platform. So you're just like having an audience, I guess, but I've always known it as being a platform medium and uh, yeah, that's that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny and and it could be just me, I suppose, but Until I uh, started meeting my psychic and medium friends from across the pond, I never really heard the term. And when I looked it up, I never really found like I got a clear answer about what the platform part of that term is. That's fascinating. So it's kind of like a graduated uh, medium after you've been in training then. Yes, pretty much. I mean, I'm not quite sure if it's just a local thing that I've picked up, but as I say, Once you've sort of left your development groups and then you go on to a close circle, if you're lucky enough to to get that chance to work with a medium that's already established, as you say, then you'll go on to be a fledgling. You'll go to meetings with that medium and sort of do two joint messages really on the platform. And then the churches maybe phone you and say, well, actually, you were quite good tonight. And then they'll book you by yourself. Yeah. So taking the platform. (laughs) Very cool. So you've been a member of the Spiritualist Church for nearly your whole life, and you have family members who have been spiritualists. I want you to tell us about that, and do you have other psychics and mediums in your family? Well, I started at Spiritualist Church when I was 13 years old. That's uh, 30-something years ago now. And it was basically my mum that was the um, – she wasn't ever a medium, and she still isn't a medium but she's had an interest in spiritualism, and that's come from her mum, who was, um, I mean, our family all come from London, as you can tell from my voice, and my grandmother used to attend spiritual churches in North London, and I think it was her wish, because she she died when I was about five years old, and talking to my mum, she says it was my grandmother's wish to really, to become a medium. And that, that's where it stems from. As far as I know, it doesn't go back any further than that in the family. 
but I'm very lucky to say that my grandmother now works with me on the platform. She is deceased. <laughs> and uh, every every time I get up and work, she's she's by the side of me working, which is fantastic. And I say I was 13 years old when I first attended Spiritualist Church and I was told at one of my very early meetings that I was going to be a platform medium. And I thought, yeah, OK, <laughs> when's that ever going to happen? You know, at the age of 13, you want everything straight away. Uh-huh. And doesn't happen in life like that so um and then I basically went on to art college after that in my teens I did fine art and photography and mediumship went on the back burner totally had no interest in it and didn't attend a church for many years and it was about the age of I think I got married when I was 29 and I'd said to my husband I'd said when we first started going out that I was a spiritualist And I don't think he was really prepared for what was to come because after I told him that, I sort of flung myself back into it and I haven't stopped. And uh, that was several years. We've been married for, oh, about 13 years now. So, uh, yeah, it's it's probably a good 15 years that I've, I've sort of been back in the throes of going to spiritual churches. I think it's something we hear often where... Uh, you know, young people have special abilities in these areas and they, in the teen years, tend to, I don't know if it's kind of a denial or a fear of it or or something, but they, you know, tend to stay away from it and then hit it again in, later in life. I hear that a lot. Yeah, I think, I mean, looking back on my teens, I think I just had other things to do. I, I mean, college was a very crazy time. We were going uh, into Europe, Amsterdam, we were doing all the sort of art galleries and I was having a fantastic time. And then I think you get into that process of going to work and it becomes that daily grind and you think, well, there's more to life than this, than just, you know, getting up every day and doing the same thing. And I think that's when the old brain cells start thinking, hey, let's um, let's explore this a little bit more. Yeah, and everybody grows and changes And, you know, I can relate that to my own life in your 30s, even just like, wow, uh, this is something I want to try. Yeah, I think I think you get that wake up call, don't you? It's like, hey, look, I'm I'm 30 something or I'm in my late 20s. And uh, it's uh, it's about time that perhaps I, I don't know, uh, woke up to reality, as it were. Mm hmm. So I'm so happy to hear that your grandmother is working with you. I think that's cool. That was going to be my next question. Very cool of her to help you. So when we think of spiritualism, so often I think many of us think of the turn of the century, dark rooms, seances, spirit trumpets, and things like that. And I'm actually fascinated by the movement and, and you know, that time period. But I'm wondering if you can give us a picture of what modern spiritualism looks like. Yeah, sure. Well, when I first started... I, my basic training was done at a church down on the um, the southeast coast, a little town called Hive in Kent, and they've got a fantastic spiritual church there. And uh, I basically started off in a development group. So w- what we did, we had a teacher in that group, and we would go over everything from mediumship to healing. We did psychic art. So you were sort of getting a taste for a little bit of everything. And then you would maybe get an interest for something else. For me, it was always mediumship. Um, I seem to just have the ability to go forward with mediumship. But it's very open. We don't work with the lights off unless we've got an evening service where we still have the lights on, but the the (laughs) windows are covered up. But um, no, there's the only time I've ever sat in a dark room is um, I went and watched an evening of trance mediumship Mm. um, which again is another fascinating side to mediumship but it's very much in the open and I think perhaps if people think that we're if you look back to the turn of the century as you say um, if people think mediums are all about that now they should really go and see some fresh young mediums working because that's certainly not what we do it is very up to date we work in the daylight and uh, yeah a lot of people are giving good up-to-date messages and a little later, I want to ask you about maybe some of the tools that you you would use in some of your development circles. Also, I've always wanted to visit 
Lilydale here in the U.S., which of course is the largest spiritualist camp and center for spiritualism here. Is there a similar kind of camp where you are? Yeah, we've got, I mean, we're very fortunate here in the UK because we, I think we accept spiritualism pretty much as some people call it a religion, um, but we've got some fantastic centres over here. We've got the Spiritual Association of Great Britain, uh, which I'm very fortunate that um, a good friend of mine, Terry Tasker, actually works there. And I've had the pleasure of working on the platform with Terry. I've never actually been there myself, but I've heard some really good reviews about it. Marion, you have shared a few stories with me recently, and I wondered if you might share some of those with us. One in particular gave me chills, and I gave you a little heads up on this, but it's the experience you had of helping someone cross over. It sounds like an amazing story, and I'd love to hear, have the listeners hear it. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll work for the Royal Mail, um, which is one of the like, biggest postal carriers in the in the UK. And um, we get, like most mail companies around the world, we get exceptionally busy on the run-up to Christmas. And I remember the day, it was November the 21st, and I was out in a little village called Sandhurst in Kent. And um, I was running late that day, and I was particularly looking at my watch thinking, oh, I'm never going to get the post done. And I was in this little close, which was mainly made up of um, what we call bungalows. I don't know what you'd call them, single story mm -hmm. houses. It's mainly where older people would reside. They've, they're, they're quite strange bungalows. They've got driveways that slope downwards. So uh, the bungalow sort of sits on a slope down from the main road. And uh, I walked down this one particular drive and there was this gentleman laying on the floor. And my first thought was, oh, my goodness, he's fallen over. So I rushed down to him. And when I got nearer to him, I thought, he's dead. <laughs> you know, you just get that look and you just think, he's he's gone. Wow. And um, so I was down, I chucked my post bag off my shoulder. Uh, I thought, right, dial 999. It would be 911, I believe, in the US. Right, right. And um, I was on the on the telephone uh, phoning him up saying, I think this, this guy's passed over. And in the meantime, his wife came out of the door. And what struck me, she was so calm. And I said to her, could you please try and find the neighbour or any neighbour? And uh, in the meantime, the lady, the dispatcher, had said to me, do you think you could possibly try and give uh, like heart resuscitation to this gentleman? So I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give it a go. So uh, I took, like the first aid training sort of comes into play, and I took this gentleman's false teeth out of his mouth <laughs> and um, tried uh, sort of doing the pumping on the chest like you do. Well, I was getting nowhere fast. Um, it was the most awful experience in some ways because uh, I, I don't believe they asked you to do it now, but at the time the lady on the phone said, do you think you could try and give him mouth to mouth? And I thought, oh, my God goodness you know it's it's okay doing this sort of thing uh in first aid on a dummy but actually having to do it on a <laughs> a person is a very different experience mm -hmm. and his wife i could hear her on the telephone and she said she was obviously calling their daughters up and she said oh um do you think you could get over here she said your father's dead outside and I kept thinking, I'm trying to revive this this chat. And she was on the phone just saying, yeah, he's dead. Um, so I was thinking, oh, well, anyway, I seemed after a lifetime, a paramedic turned up. They just strolled down the path and I thought, well, there's no hurry there whatsoever. And uh, she looked at him and she went, yeah, he's gone. <laughs> it was like, yeah, he's he's not here. Well, by that time, family had all turned up. And uh, I was sort of in a bit of a stunned state of shock. Well, they all disappeared into the to the bungalow, and the paramedic said to me, do you think you could wait here in case the police want to take a statement off of you? So I said, yeah, fine, that's great. So they went in and closed the door. And I was standing there, and I looked down, and I thought, 
this is such an odd situation because I'm just standing out here with a dead guy. And it was just one of those real surreal situations. And I think my um, clairvoyance suddenly kicked in and I was very aware of this gentleman. I could see him standing by his body and he was just looking down at himself and he looked totally bemused, half as though somebody had just come out of uh, a car smash or something and was like, what on earth has just gone on? Mm -hmm. And I said, I remember saying in my head to him, you've passed over, my friend. Please step into the light. Please go towards the light. Now, I couldn't see the light myself, but I could see in my mind's eye that he turned his back to me and just walked forward. And I said the Lord's Prayer for him. I just have this deep feeling inside that I was supposed to be there at that time, not to obviously um, save this gentleman's life, but to help him pass into the spirit realms. And I'm, it, there's sort of a sense of I'm really glad that I was there for him. Um, it, very strange situation, and it's never happened to me since, thank goodness. But, yeah, so that's that. Oh, my God, Marion. Now, is was this recent or was this sort of earlier on in your development? Two, that was 2008 that happened. Yeah, I was a little bit shook up, and uh, they had to come and pick me up from work, and uh, I wasn't in a fit state to go and deliver any more mail that day. So <laughs> I wouldn't think so. So that's probably one of the bigger experiences that you've had like that. Yes. Yes. It, it, yeah, it probably was. But um, I, I believe I told you one about my nephew that I, I uh, typed down for you, which sticks in my mind a great deal more than that. But um, yeah, very odd. Well, would you like to share that one? Because that one's a good one, too. I read it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I couldn't have told you when this was. My nephew died in 2004. My nephew had been involved in um, what I guess you would call gang culture up in London. Mm. Uh, My middle sister lives up in South London, and uh, he got involved with a gang of lads that he was trying to get out of that culture. Um, I think they were stealing cars, and uh, my nephew David was very good at mechanics so that they they would bring stuff around to his house, and um, he would fix stuff up, and then he would get payment in some kind of form, maybe not money, but perhaps things off of other blokes. And in part payment for a job that he'd done, this young lad brought a moped for my nephew. I I don't know where he thought it had come from. I don't even know if the thing had keys to it, but this motorbike had been stolen from a lad that lived a couple of blocks around from my nephew. And um, the the long and the short of it was that this guy come looking for this motorbike. He'd heard that my nephew was on it and David was riding this thing down the street and he came out at him with a knife and put it through his sternum, basically, and uh, he he bled to death. But he died with his crash helmet on. So this is the part of the story that's um, significant with the crash helmet. Um, this is confusing because my husband's name is David also. So we've got two Davids in this story. Now, this must have, I'm guessing this would have been about 2005 that this happened. For some odd reason, I was woken in the middle of the night and I saw what I believe to be my husband at the end of the bed, but on my husband's side of the bed, wearing a black crash helmet. Now, Most people would think, well, why would he be wearing that in the bedroom? But (laughs) my husband used to keep his crash helmet and all his levers in the cupboard in our bedroom. (laughs) So to me, it wasn't an odd thing. I just thought, well, maybe he's sleepwalking. I thought, what is he doing? So I sat up in bed and I watched him make his way across the end of the bed. He was hanging on as though he was um, partially patting the bed frame to sort of half as though he couldn't quite see out this crash helmet. And he got round to my side of the bed, and I was watching him all this time, and he got hold of the quilt cover, and he started pulling it. And um, I kept thinking, what on earth is he doing? And for some reason at that moment, I looked down to where my husband would be lying, and he was still lying in bed asleep. And I've never pulled that quilt so fast over my head. (laughs) Uh, 
<laughs> which is funny, really. I mean, I'm a spiritualist. I'm a medium. So why would you do that? But it scared the life out of right, me. Right, right. It's funny because my sister said to me, well, why did you do that? She said, why Why didn't you sort of speak to him? And I said, I'll be honest with you, Sue. I said, the moment I'd realised that it was spirit I was seeing, I think he would have disappeared anyway. But it, that's the longest time I've ever seen spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, it must have been well over a minute that he was making his way around the bed. But bizarre, very strange. Wow. And so that that was it after it, he disappeared, definitely after you took cover? Yeah. Yeah, it was nothing else in the bedroom. I eventually sort of peeped out of the bedroom and it was empty. So can you imagine what the message was or or why he was reaching out? I don't know, to be honest. Um, I always believe my nephew wants me to probably make more contact with my sister on a spiritual level because my sister for many years found it very difficult after he passed, um, not to accept that he was in the spirit realms, but basically to sort of know that he was still around her on a daily basis and have that close contact with him because they were very close, um, my sister and my nephew. So I believe that's what it was. Perhaps he just wanted me to just pass that message on that he had been he'd been around and he wanted to make his presence known. Mm-hmm. And I think a, a lot of times you'll hear mediums say that, spirits and souls won't come toward you if they if they feel you're in fear you know and so perhaps that's something that he realized he he scared you and so that was his cue to step back a bit yeah i'm pretty sure that um our spirit friends know if we can sort of face a confrontation head on or whether it's gonna scare the life out of somebody um yeah i'm I'm sure that they know what we're capable of dealing with it must have been a horrible loss for your families. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it, it's it been sort of a long time coming to terms with things, but um, I think it's made us stronger in a lot of ways. I think it's tested people's um, perhaps beliefs in uh, what, what we've seen we've been believing in. I think it's um, it sort of tested us all to the limits, really, but we've we've come out the other side stronger for it. So, yeah, that's good. Well, good. Now let's talk development circles. As as a term, and I think the concept as a whole, I'd never heard of such a thing until someone several years ago suggested I read about the Skull Group. I think it was 1993 when a group of psychic researchers and mediums embarked on a series of experiments in England, and the results and evidence of life after death that they found is just mind-blowing. And I wanted to make sure if any of my listeners haven't checked out the book called The Skull Experiment or or watched the documentary The Afterlife Investigations, then I would highly recommend it. And I'll throw some links into the show notes. But Marion, is your development circles, are they similar to the work of the Skull Group? Well, I'd be one of your listeners that um, hasn't read up anything about the Skull Group, I'm sorry to say. Wow. Are you saying that's from England? Yes. I've heard you mention it before, but I've never done any research. Wow, maybe it's not as well known as I thought. Yeah, development groups, um, well, from my experience, as I say, I started down at Hive and I did several years trying a bit of everything, really. I say psychic art, um, healing on... I'm currently doing a healing course at the moment. But I think once you've gone past that development stage of, yeah, okay, I'm interested in perhaps mediumship or trance mediumship, then I think you, um, how it works over here, you, you sort of have to be asked to go on to a closed circle. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's quite a privileged thing in a lot of cases because there are people that have closed circles and they're usually run by one medium and you'll have a group of um, maybe six, eight, ten people in that group that basically sit possibly for meditation to start with and then link in clairvoyantly. Um, I mean, that's always what we've done in the past. Um, the, the close circle that I had been running in Ashford was doing exactly that. And then in the latter stages, we moved on to board use as well, which was absolutely fascinating. But, I mean, you, you can have a closed circle for trance mediumship. 
Um, I've known people s- sit for that as well. But to be actually asked to go on to a closed circle is, is quite an honor in some cases. So there are definitely like standard practices with development circles? There seems to be. I, uh, development circles are pretty much open to anyone that wants to give it a go. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, they're the best way to start, the best way to get your foot in the door. If you're showing potential in one particular subject, then you will normally be asked into a closed circle. I, I was funny enough asked into two closed circles at the same time, and I sat in both of them for a while, and uh, I kept thinking, well, no, this one doesn't feel right for me. And uh, I, I sort of said, okay, it's not for me, and I chose the other one. Yeah, I, I think you, you sort of know when you get that sort of gut feeling when you know something's right or it feels correct. So what kind of experiments do you work on and and how do you document evidence? Is there a process for that? The only stuff that I've ever documented has been on the uh, Ouija board. Mm-hmm. That was a strange way that it started. We we sat down one evening and uh, we were talking about table tipping of all things. Have, have you ever done table tipping? I have or not. I've read about it. I have not tried table tipping. Well, I, I mentioned the medium Terry Tasker. Mm-hmm from Hive and works at the SAGB and uh, I've seen him do table tipping and it's absolutely amazing and um, I was talking to the people in the circle and I said if you ever get the chance to see it go and look at it because it's fantastic and one of the group said oh she said I know somebody that does that and would maybe come into our circle and do experiment table tipping so we said oh that's a good idea so She said, I'll phone him up and uh, see if we can get him down. Well, this guy turned up. I'm not going to mention his name because I don't, I wouldn't know if he would like to be mentioned in Mm -hmm. connection with what I'm going to say. He turned up with a group of about four other ladies and um, showed us table tipping, which was great. We all had a go at doing that. And then he got the Ouija board out. And um, I must admit, my experience of Ouija up until then, well, I'd never done it, but. I'd heard some horror stories and we all looked at each other and I thought, oh, what on earth? What on earth's going on here? (laughs) And I'll tell you something, Patrick, it was one of the best evenings we ever had. We were talking about this for weeks afterwards and uh, they said to us, look, you've got a really strong group here. You could run a group doing a Ouija board. And I gave this a hell of a lot of thought because... I wanted to make sure that the group was safe Mm -hmm. and I wanted to know that if something did go wrong, I was in full control and I knew how to deal with the situation. So I did a lot of research and that's basically how I found your podcast. And I was just flicking through it by chance and I saw the Karen A. Dolman link. And I thought it just seemed it would all sort of fell into place for me at that particular time. That's why I'm so thankful to you and Karen for um, for the advice that has been given on the board. Yeah, so the, the group doesn't exist anymore. I've recently moved to a different church down on the coast. Uh, there was a few differences of opinion. So I'm hoping to set up a new group. That's in the, the process at the moment. So half of the original group are still working with me. Mm-hmm. And um, we're hoping to set the board up and start doing that again soon. So I'm sort of excited about that. But so, uh, yeah, I'm chomping at the bit, waiting to get on with it. But um, I, I'm sort of in hiatus at the moment. Spirit are uh, dragging their heels. So I just think, well, <laughs> I'll wait till they're ready. <laughs> well, Karen A. Dahlman is such an inspiration, isn't she? I mean, she's so helpful when it comes to this kind of thing. I'm glad you found her episode to help you out. Yeah, it was fantastic. And I contacted Karen after that, and I'm sure – I drive her mad, to be honest, because I'm always saying, well, you know, <laughs> this has happened this evening, and what do you think about this, and how would you deal with this? And uh, I'm sure she's pulling her hair out, but, uh, yeah, she's been <laughs> she's been a great help, really has. No, I think she's a great person. Tell us about that first communication and what it was like through the board. Well, the, the thing is that I don't know if you've ever used the board, Patrick, but the communication for us came through exceptionally quickly. And I've heard from Karen that some people can sit there for ages and the planchette doesn't move or the glass. That would or be me. 
that's that's me. <laughs> yeah, and for us, it's always just been bang. We're in there, and the, the things whizzing around the table, and we always make sure that we're working in love and light. We're working to the highest energies possible, and um, because as soon as we know that there's a lower entity in there, we shut the board down immediately. Mm-hmm. We've always had, I say, the glass has always moved very quickly. When you get that love and light message come through, the energy in the room and that gut feeling that you get when you're working, it's just a feeling of knowing. I'm trying to think of an example of a really good message we've had, but there's just been some very weird stuff come through. And you may be, the whole group will start laughing and they'll throw comments (laughs) about, and you get an immediate answer off the board. Yeah, it's very strange. It's it's quite a quick method of working. My main guide that I work with doesn't like working in that method. Um, I think he finds it quite hard communicating because he always says, I prefer the clairvoyance. Mm-hmm. And you just never know who you're going to get through. You might get somebody you've not seen for 20, 30 years or a, perhaps a grandparent that you've, you've never seen before. And, yeah, it's wonderful. So a lot of the communication you get are people that you were connected to in life and. Pretty much. Sometimes you will get an odd ball come through. We had one occasion where we had to shut the board down, um, where one of our members of the circle actually felt like they were going to be pushed off their chair. And I said, no, that's that. And we closed the board down and everyone was fine. But um, no, apart from that, we've mainly had relatives come through, uh, perhaps people that have worked with somebody, a work colleague, We've even had pets come through. I tried an experiment that Karen spoke about in her book, The um, Spirits of Ouija, mm-hmm. the second book she brought out. And I must tell you this, Patrick, because it was it was quite amazing. We have two boxer dogs, and uh, they're both sisters. They don't look that alike, but they are sisters. <laughs> and um, uh, one of the females we've got, Bindi, had a lump on her shoulder. She had a growth. And my guide came through. And um, I said to Grey Feather, I said, would it be possible, could we make communication with my boxer dogs at home? And uh, there was quite a long pause. Half or so, as though they were referring to somebody else that was working on the board as well. And um, he came back and said yes. And uh, I basically asked what the dogs were doing. And he said uh, the dogs were asleep on the settee. Now, I can, I can verify all this because I asked my husband when I got home and he said, yes, he went for all this and it was, yeah, the dogs are doing this. <laughs> and anyway, he said, Bindi is not happy. This is one of our boxers. I said, why is Bindi not happy? And he told us that it's because of the lump on her shoulder. And uh, my parents sit on the board as well. And uh, my, my parents live with us. And uh, Bindi is actually my mum and dad's dog. So she said, right we get Bindi down to the vets. And I basically think that message actually saved our dog's life because they did an operation on her and the vet said, I've got a funny feeling it's a tumour she's got in uh, her shoulder. They operated, um, she's got a ginormous scar on her arm, but I believe she's very lucky to be alive. And she's a totally different dog now. She runs about before she just looked miserable. And I believe that was from that message from the board. So uh, it's a fantastic piece of communicational kit, to be honest with you. Wow. I can tell you I'm one of those people that I don't know that I've put hours and hours and hours into it. But uh, for probably the last five years, you know, occasionally I'll get the board out and I usually, you know, very formally set up some experiment and and often it's by myself. Sometimes it's with like my mother or, or someone else. and. And I'll have other tools out, but I've never once received any activity or movement from the board. So I was curious to know if there was, I know you said it started pretty much right off the bat, but do you think there was any magic ingredient that helped you get results from the board? No, I I personally, I'm a great believer in you are the energy that you build up within yourself. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the people in the group built up that lovely loving energy as we sit because I usually do a quick meditation before we sit for the board Mm -hmm. and we always try and link with the highest energies possible Um, a little bit like 
I could say this to you, you may not understand what I'm saying, but when you sit before you're going into that clairvoyant state, what you'll be doing is you'll be hiring your energy levels to try and blend with that of spirit because when they link with you on a clairvoyant level, they have to lower their energies. Right. And the theory is they, they meet somewhere in the middle and that's where you get the clairvoyance. So I was sort of making the group work in this way so that we're working with the higher energies and then when we've done that meditation, we go straight into board work. And I think that's probably the key to sort of do that rather than just go straight in. And, you know, you've always got to make sure you protect yourself when you're working, whether it be on the board or mediumship or healing. I always put that, that prayer out for yourself because you're using yourself as an instrument for spirit. Right. So I think that's a really important thing to get across to people. If you don't look after yourself, no one else is going to do it. You've got to think about putting that cloak of protection around you, working safely at all times. But I think the energy in the group helps. And spirit like the light energy. They like the energy of laughter. And we found the more we sit around and joke and uh, everyone starts laughing, the quicker <laughs> the, the glass moves on the board. Mm -hmm. So I think they, they sort of feed off of that energy, which is why I always think it's, it's good to work in a light energy. And for those people that go in and think, I'm going to do the board and I'm looking for negativity, well, that's just what you're going to get. Right, you you right. get what you project. Yeah, and I've said it so many times. You always hear, at least around here, people who, when they immediately start judging the Ouija board, they have a story of, well, you know, well, there was this one time when we were kids and we were in my friend's basement. Or, <laughs> you know, this one time we were at a party and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, you know, who can you trust in those situations? I don't yeah. know that I would trust any of my friends in those situations if you're just at a party and hanging out and someone busts out a the, Ouija The likely it is, Patrick, if you're at a party, what have you been doing? You've probably been drinking. Mm -hmm. People have that, yeah, let's get in contact with something dark out there and uh yeah it starts off as a laugh and uh i think people get quite scared by it so um yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend somebody just dabble in it without sort of doing your homework to start with yeah and think about it as more of a formal kind of experiment i guess i need to work on some some visualizations it sounds like from what you're saying before I yeah jump into yeah this definitely thing. yeah i can't recommend meditation for mediumship or that highly enough it's um yeah it's good for you very good for you so are you against calling on any specific spirits in your work with the ouija board sometimes you know this is controversial with people in what way do you um what a particular relative you mean or yeah um, or if if there was a specific uh, i don't know past spirit you wanted to learn from or wanted to to call to communicate with you through the board i guess some people would refer to that as summoning or something like that what are your okay. thoughts on that? Well, from my personal experience, um, especially with mediumship, I don't quite know. I'm, I'm not. Um, I haven't been doing the board that long to, to be an expert at it. But definitely through mediumship, I would say that you don't really get the choice of who comes through because I see the medium as the telephone, and it's very much a three way communication. And I think people tend to forget that especially when you're, you're sitting and you're in an audience and you've gone to somebody and they will very often sit there nodding their head. And I say, look, spirit need to hear your voice. And what you were saying back at the start of can you summon someone in particular, generally no. I think spirit will come through. And I've, I've had situations where somebody's come to me really disappointed at the end of an evening and said, you brought my aunt through tonight or whoever. And I really want to hear from my mum or my dad. But th the thing is, what they tend to forget is the message that that person has brought could be very valid to them at that time in their life. But all they're actually focusing on is, I wanted my mum or my dad or whoever there, but they got their aunt, their uncle or somebody completely different. No, generally, I, I can't just say, come forward. You know, if a spirit wants to do it, they'll they'll come. They'll make sure they get through. But uh, I've never been able to do that. <laughs> well, and I would say that as someone who's definitely not a medium, 
but uh, would love to be, but <laughs> am not. I never really felt bad about that because it's it's my thought that I can request to have the presence of someone or get contact from someone, but they're in control of themselves. And so if they, I don't feel like me asking just pulls someone to the board and, <laughs> uh, you know, takes up their time when maybe they don't want to be here. I think they, uh, they can control that. So I've never felt too bad for calling a spirit. I generally think as well that if you've been sitting um, pondering over somebody that's passed a spirit, those thoughts are very live things. Um, once you send a thought out onto the ether, it's picked up by spirit. And I think you sort of call that person in, in a way, by, by just sitting, thinking, oh, my mum or granddad or granny. You're just sending that life thought out. And I think they pick that up and they come in naturally. Very much I give messages to people. And the amount of time times that I've said, um, you've been thinking about your mum recently, and they look at me as if to say, well, how did you know that? Because this lady's come through and told me that you've just done that or you've been looking at photographs of this lady, they're very aware of what goes on in our lives and exactly what we're doing or what we need in our lives at a particular time. Whether or not that's always what we want for ourselves can be a very different story. And I sometimes wish we could see the bigger picture. And I think that's why you've got to have a lot of trust in spirit because they can see the bigger picture of what's going on in your life. Whereas we're a little bit blinkered, we can only see perhaps what we want to see a lot of the time. How often do you think that they get frustrated with us because they're trying to communicate and we're not receiving? And what can you tell people to do to you know receive better, I guess, those messages? I think, oh, there must be a hell of a lot of frustration. <laughs> um, I said this to someone the other day. It must be an awful feeling to... I mean, each and every one of us has got a guide or somebody that works with us on a very personal level. And, you know, if you're working with someone that's mediumistic, you must think that you've hit the jackpot in some lights because they can be very aware of that guide or the family member that draws close. But if you've got somebody that's non med or they believe that they're non-mediumistic or they have no interest in this way of life, I would presume it must be like hitting your head against the wall sometimes as you're, you're trying to lead somebody on a particular path or you're trying to make your presence known and someone's not listening. It must be incredibly infuriating. I, I sort of can't imagine that really. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's why some houses have noisier spirits than others because they just feel that they need to make that presence known. Yeah, and I think sometimes when you'll when either I'm watching some show on television where they're showing paranormal activity and people's responses to it, or if I get an email from someone who is telling me some story, and one of the first things they say is, "Well, I I want to tell them to go away and give me space," and I'm like, "Well, don't picture this as immediately just some scary looking ghost because <laughs> it might me." You know, Aunt Edna just trying to <laughs> shut the door exactly. and, and make noise. And so that always is kind of frustrated me. It's like, well, maybe it's just who knows who's trying to to get your attention. I what there was right before we moved, like uh two months ago, I had just been working on one of the podcast episodes, actually, the episode on EVP. And I was kind of putting things away. And I have a cabinet, a kind of a two-door cabinet, and I keep a lot of the tools and the meters for spirit communication in there and, you know, a lot of the recorders and stuff like that. And one of the doors just flipped open on itself. And I don't I don't get activity like this. It's very rare. And uh, I just kind of looked over there and, and thought, and I thought, okay, and I'm putting, you know, two and two together. I'm like, okay, that's my cabinet where I would typically keep those tools. And uh, it was very late at night and I was heading to bed. So I'm kind of kicking myself for not getting the recorder out or, you know, something like that. But I, do, I did sit there and say, okay, I'm listening. Is this someone, I mean, are you trying to get my attention? Am I, do you need to communicate? Who is this? 
and I think that you've hit the nail on the head with the just saying to the spirit, I know you're there, I, I've sort of sent your presence. And I think sometimes, Patrick, that's the one thing they want. They want you to just say, yeah, I'm aware that you're around. I'm aware that you've moved this or that or open the door. And it may just be the fact that they're urging you to get back on to doing podcasts because we've all been missing them. <laughs> so perhaps that's what it is. Perhaps they're, perhaps they're pushing you to do a few more. Well, I am I'm definitely on my way to becoming more regular with them. It's it's uh, taken me a while, but I can't wait to get this interview out so people can listen to this. So do you do you have any advice or suggestions for people out there listening who are either curious about learning more about the afterlife or spiritualism or development circles? Do you have any advice for them or places to look or things to read? Well, I'm guessing most of your audience are probably from the USA. I would, I'm imagining that anyway. Probably. For me personally, I would definitely say go to a spiritual church if there's one near you because a lot of the time you're going to see good quality mediums that are working every single week and you generally don't pay a great deal. You Over in England, we all usually give a donation for a Saturday or a Sunday service. I wouldn't recommend people going out and necessarily paying to see a medium. There are some very good mediums out there that you can sit and have a reading with, but there are also mediums out there that make money off the backs of people. So I wouldn't recommend that if people are starting out. Definitely go down um, the spiritual church route if you've got access to that. Other than that, I definitely recommend reading books perhaps by get books by mediums that you know your means what are they james van prague um mm-hmm. who else have you got who's who's the one from new york that talks quite fast talks uh, i can't think of his name uh are you talking about john edwards maybe? yeah john, edwards, john edward um, maybe you, yeah i mean you've probably got some more well-known mediums that perhaps i don't know about yeah. but um yeah i would sort of look down the track of getting as much knowledge into your head as possible, reading about what perhaps other mediums have done. Sometimes their lives can start from very humble beginnings to actually where they've worked themselves up to. Development groups are great um, because you're sort of dabbling in different aspects to spiritualism. Um, You may find that perhaps mediumship's not for you. Perhaps uh, a lot of people are drawn towards hands-on healing, which again is very beneficial thing to go into but arm yourself with with as much knowledge as you can that's my main suggestion to uh, anyone that's starting out and if you do sort of get lucky enough to get invited into a group make sure that that group feels right and go with that gut instinct because out of everything that I've learned in this way of life your gut instinct will tell you everything whether something's right or wrong and uh yeah just just have fun as you do it really i certainly wish we had more development circles like this here and i can tell you if i lived on the same chunk of land as you i would be pushing myself into your development circle because it sounds so incredibly interesting and i hope you do keep in touch with your work and some of the stuff that you guys get from your work yeah of course i think we're exceptionally lucky here in england we're inundated with spiritual churches and groups and um yeah i'd be more than happy to keep you updated with um our goings on (laughs) so um yeah it's fantastic i'm really glad that um i've had the chance to speak to you and i want to tell you you're so fun to talk to and i'm i'm glad you reached out and sent me that either through Facebook or email. I don't remember, but I'm glad you did. And uh, you rock. Thank you very much. You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out bigseance.com for more discussion. Before I jump in with listener feedback, I want to make sure I point out that in the show notes, 
I've included photos of Marion and her development circle. So follow the link to bigseance.com and you can check those out. Now to some shout outs and some listener feedback. Two new iTunes reviews came in recently, and the first one came from Brio612, who says, I really enjoy listening to this podcast. I found it through another of my favorites, History Goes Bump. Where have you heard that before? The topics are interesting. It's well produced, and the host does a great job keeping the show moving along and making me want to hear more. The chosen interviews are always entertaining. This one is on my daily listening routine. I recommend if you have any interest in the paranormal to give it a try. Well, thank you, Brio612. There are so many warm fuzzies in that review, so thank you. Also, J.C. Wood, STL, says, Recently discovered the podcast and have now listened to nearly all the episodes. Highly recommend if you have interest in the paranormal. I also happen to know that J.C. Wood, STL, has been helping to get the word out on Twitter lately, and so I want to thank him for that. Thanks for the reviews and the support, folks, and thank you for listening today. There's more good stuff coming, and I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com, now the home of both the blog and the podcast. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Do you have any comments or feedback? Please contact me at Patrick at BigSeance.com. You can call my feedback line at 77 77- Five five. Tell me that seven seven five five eight three five five six three. You can also record audio feedback right from the site using the SpeakPipe link included in the show notes. I could decide to include your voice in a future show. Thank you so much for listening and reading. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. I hope my accent wasn't too bad and uh, I wasn't speaking too fast. Um, oh, I, I love it. We love your I accent. Have. We always love uh, your a, accent. A little bit of a London twang in there, I'm afraid. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's okay. People hear my um, Missouri hick twang all day long. <laughs>